Hello and welcome to another episode of Forge Talks, a show where I am trying to find out as much as I can in the world of digital identity. And I'm doing this the only way I know how, by speaking to the smartest people I can get my hands on. There are a few smarter than my guest today, our shiny new Chief Technology Officer, Eve Mailer. Eve, welcome to the show. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to be here virtually with you, Fraser. <laughs> Some may or may not know, Eve and I uh, actually go pretty far back. Um, we've even shared a stage together as part of a uh, Forge Rock musical collaboration called Uman League. Some, some fond memories uh, there. It was great. It was a great time. We should do it again sometime. Let's jam. <laughs> <laughs> and um, firstly, congratulations on the new job. Hopefully you're, you're settling in well. We're discussing today whether security and privacy is still important uh, in today's world. Nah. Uh, <laughs> no? Yeah. No, that's of what... course it's important. It's all important. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, this could, this could be a short episode. In the Venn um, diagram of security and privacy, you know, they have a lot to do with each other and they're very important. I put it up at the top. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Good to get that out of the way at the start. And apologies for the clickbaity title. Um, so we're in a different world today than we were like six months ago i would say obviously with the um the recent outbreak of coronavirus has changed a lot and so with respect to information security and privacy um just could you just like give us a lay of the land how things are looking compared to to you know how they were six months ago yeah well obviously um, we are in a different world. We're in a more digital world. I mean, I'm not shocking anybody by saying that. People who are watching this know. Um, just as an example, there's a lot more that we're doing around telehealth. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of appointments now, uh, virtually, um, and we're doing a lot more mobile banking. Um, it's been estimated, for example, that just in the first month of the UK lockdown, Six million Brits, so that's about 12% of the population, uh, downloaded a mobile banking app for the first time. So if you think wow. about you know, all those banks uh, having that first touch point in that fashion, having to deal with it. So um, that's, that's a lot of what I call hashtag digital transformation pressure <laughs> on a <Nice>. bank. <laughs> um, <laughs> And during this whole period, you know, the last few months, I've probably created one new login a week. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's a lot of work that a lot of companies have to do and get it right. Um, and, and during all that, I mean, you have to, you got to get the security right, you got to get the privacy right, and you have to get all the identity experiences right, um, particularly for people who, are, who used to be offline people um, and now have to become online people. So that's one of the big differences now is that you have to do it all and all the pressure is just rising. Yeah, for sure. And so what specifically are you seeing then uh, in terms of security? Right. So um, it, it's interesting. You know, I mentioned this, you know, 12% of, of adult Brits were downloading these mobile apps. Um, there's a new urgency around this kind of open API movement. You know, the UK actually innovated open banking. Um, and so there was this kind of regulatory pressure. There was a deadline. And, and open banking is around um, its API-based regulations along with technical standards um, that are uh, generating greater security, privacy, data portability, um, and interoperability for uh, bank account information and the ability to pay uh, out of your bank account for things like you know, a third party merchant or aggregating your bank account information um, in a third party application. So um, that's information, personal information flowing from your bank um, to third parties across domains. You know, it used to be just identity information when we talked about federated identity flinging across the internet and you have to do it in a secure fashion. Now it's all kinds of information through standards. <laughs> um, in this case, the banking industry and they're telling banks they gotta do it. So, um, you know, in this environment where all of these citizens are now, you know, going off and getting a mobile banking app for the first time, well, now you really gotta do it and you gotta do it right. So um, that's, there's new urgency around that. Um, the same is happening with healthcare. So in the US, there's a number of new rules imposed by the government around uh, patients getting access to electronic health records 
Um, and so that's impacting uh, the healthcare institutions and uh, health insurers, and they have to get that right as well. And so it, it goes in widening circles from there. You know, there's IoT devices that are healthcare related. And so, you know, that's consumer devices and health devices. And so it's not just uh, data, it can be device control, you know, a pacemaker or something like that. Mm. Yeah. And I guess uh, on the flip side then, what are you seeing in terms of privacy? You know, privacy is a really interesting area. And, you know, through this global crisis, so um, many companies are actually hurting. And so a lot of jurisdictions, countries are slowing the rollout of the privacy regulations. So you think, oh, you know, does this mean this is going to impact negatively people's privacy? Um, in addition, um, we have these public health imperatives where we see things like contact tracing applications. And there's a big discussion about, uh, well, is this negatively impacting people's privacy? Um, it may be. <laughs> um, I, I personally am, am, am somewhat suspicious of a lot of these things. At the same time, a lot of uh, privacy advocacy groups, uh, legislators, and individuals are um, suddenly paying more attention because the nature of this health information is so important that everybody's paying more attention to it. So regulations and laws may be sort of softening temporarily in, the, in this mm -hmm. interim, but at the same time, people are paying more attention personally because it's so important. So I think companies have to pay more attention. They can't slow down in a way. Sure. And I feel like as well, like people, um, end users and customers are really, I feel like so much, so much more switched on and educated than they've yes. ever been. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how would you advise then businesses to prioritize both security, uh, and, and privacy for their own sake? And of course, for the sake of the end users. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can't really compromise on anything. I think, you know, for a lot of companies, um, their business hasn't slowed down, really. Um, they, if, they, if they live in the digital world, if they have to get more into the digital world, the way that they succeed is to, is to be more digital friendly, not to compromise security, privacy, or, or their identity experiences. So they, um, mm. they need to design identity journeys that um, uh, put security and experience at the forefront um, at the same time. So, you know, it's easiest if you think about those things all at the same time. Um, uh, and we know from, from the zero trust world that you want to have your security controls sort of seated close to your application. Um, I I'm starting to think of applications as kind of like individuals. You know, you want to have your applications be thinking about their security uh, with the, themselves as kind of the center of the universe. So there's even right. a NIST security architecture, uh, zero trust security architecture now. Um, businesses want to uh, ensure that personal data does not cross jurisdictional uh, borders when it's not supposed to. It's funny, that's for compliance reasons. You know, uh, data doesn't know about jurisdictional borders, but you know, data packets have to care about it because of compliance. I should say hashtag yeah. because compliance, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, you know, end user consent and permission controls um, should really be put together um, in a single pane of glass um, because that's the most convenient way for people to do it. And that way people get a sense of confidence about the companies they're dealing with. Yeah, not, not exactly something that um, companies can ignore, I guess. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that uh, people find uh, inconvenient if if you don't have all of the applications manageable in one place and these days that means um, depending on regulations it could mean uh, opt-ins or opt-outs um, this is you know consent language um, and you want to have it all together in one place sure and I'm assuming given the given the way you're talking about it that this is actually something Fordrock does offer otherwise it would be uh, kind of an embarrassing <laughs> follow-up I advocate things that I think are a good idea and that um, I've actually helped us implement of course um, uh, we have a thing that we call uh, Fordrock's uh, profile and privacy management dashboard and it puts uh, consent and a lot of other permissioning controls in one place so it's from connecting uh, applications connecting devices um, a per permissioning is um, a vast universe of things that you can do. It's not just about consents. Sure. Um, and so I, I guess a sort of final question in your new role as head of the CTO office, is there anything 
cool or interesting that you guys are looking into that uh, particularly might make things easier for businesses in the future? We are investigating an area that is, you know, it's known to be um, something that the identity world is uh, looking into heavily as a, as a future area, um, decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity. Um, it's something that, you know, is not really uh, deployed yet in a lot of places, but we are looking into it with uh, some customers and some partners. Um, so we're doing some integrations in that area. Cool. And what does that look like? Um, you know, it, the, here's the language of decentralized identity. It involves uh, issuing and verifying uh, verifiable credentials. <laughs> mm -hmm. So credentials is the language of, you know, oftentimes it might be attributes, um, but it could be other things. And, and folks should, you know, if, if they're interested in knowing about this or, or doing it, um, we encourage you to get in touch if, you, if you're inter interested. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you if people um, want to know more. Uh, what's the best avenue for them to ask questions of you? <laughs> well, it's really easy. You can find us on Twitter at Forge Rock, also on, at LinkedIn. And you can go to our webpage and we have contact information there, our contact page. Brilliant. Yes, I'll, I'll put them on screen. They'll be here-ish. <laughs> Press on uh, Fraser and you'll find out how to contact us. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Eve, thank you so much. That was uh, really interesting, really insightful, and just great to catch up with you as always. It's a pleasure. And guys, hopefully you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to seeing you back here next time. Take care for now.